Good morning. Welcome, welcome back to Bookie Monsters. My name is PK. It is Thursday, January 18th. And we are here to look at the new releases that are being set into the wild this week. And on Thursdays, we look at fantasy and science fiction. And if there's time to look at anything else, we will do so. Quick announcements. There will be sprints tonight at 6.05 Mountain Time, 8.05 Eastern. They'll go for two and a half hours. Bring your own book, work on a project, or just close your eyes after a hard day. Whatever it is that will be soothing and happy for you. Good morning, Mary. Happy Thursday. Had two does cross the street in the woods when I took the girls out this morning for the business meeting. Starts the day out wonderfully. So blessed. Did the girls notice them? Have to fill the bird feeders again today. The birds are very hungry this time of year. Yep. And so far, the bear hasn't been by direct feeders. Looking large. Wow. You got some good wildlife. Some good wildlife viewing right from your house. That is fantastic. Fantastical. Uh, I didn't read much yesterday. I'm one of my uh, book journaly things I'm trying to do this year is keep track of the number of pages I read each day. Um, and apparently Wednesdays aren't a good day for me. <laughs> All right, let me get rid of this banner. And we will take a look at some fantasy and science fiction options being offered this week. This one, I think, is the biggest of the week. This is the second book in uh, probably a series at this point. This is by Heather Fawcett, Emily Wilde's Map of the Other Worlds, which is a uh, was uh, the first book was very very popular last year sort of underrated but uh definitely uh it had a strong undercurrent to it that one was emily wilde's encyclopedia of fairies when mysterious fairies from other realms appear at her university curmudgeonly professor emily wilde must uncover their secrets before it's too late Emily Wilde is a genius scholar of fairy folklore who just wrote the world's first comprehensive encyclopedia of fairies. She's learned many of the secrets of the hidden ones on her adventures and also from her fellow, fellow scholar and former rival, Wendell Babble, Babbleby. Because Babbleby is more than infuriating, you know, coffee is required, infuriatingly charming. He's an exi exiled fairy king on the run from his murderous mother and in search of a door back to his realm. And despite Emily's feelings for Babbleby, she's not, I want to put an R in there, but she's not ready to accept his proposal of marriage. Loving one of the fair folk comes with secrets and dangers. She also has a new project to focus on, a map of the realms of the fairy. While she is preparing her research, Bumblebee lands her in trouble yet again when assassins sent by his mother invade Cambridge. Now Bumblebee and Emily are on another adventure, this time to the picturesque Austrian Alps, where Emily believes they may find the door to Bumblebee's realm and the key to freeing him from his family's dark plans. But with new relationships for the prickly Emily to navigate and dangerous folk lurking in every forest and hollow, Emily must unravel the mysterious workings of fairy doors and her own heart very pretty cover once again i started the first one and it's on pause not necessarily from anything wrong with the book out kind of obviously but um just wasn't the right time for me Bella saw the deer. Ia didn't talk much about it, but I'm sure she saw them too. Yes, nice cover. The Longest Autumn by Amy Avery. For fans of Ariadne, a spellbinding debut fantasy about a human who gets trapped with the god of autumn, who brings with him life-threatening danger and a forbidden romance. Gods and myths are a big trend lately. Under the right circumstances, would even a god fall? 
Time is one of four humans. Turn. Hello. Turn is one of four humans rigorously selected to usher the turn of the seasons into the moral world. Every year she escorts the taciturn god Autumn between the godly and human realms. Autumn's seasonal stay among mortals brings cooler weather, changing leaves, and the harvest of apples and gourds until winter takes its place. This year, the enchanted mirror that separates their worlds shatters after turn and autumn pass through, trapping both of them in the human realm. As the endless autumn stretches on, crops begin to fail, and the threat of starvation looms. Away from the magic of God's home, Turn suffers debilitating headaches that return with a vengeance. Worse, Autumn's extended stay in the human realm turns him ever more mortal and vulnerable, stirring a new forbidden attraction to Turn. My beast's pronouncing that wrong. While the priesthood scrambles to find a way to reassemble the mirror, Turn digs into the temple's secrets and finds an unlikely ally or enemy in the enigmatic... There's that word again. We're going to start noticing this word. Sorcerer and master of poisons, Sidriel. Thrown into a world of mystery, betrayal, and espionage as she searches for the truth, might turn lose her morals, her hard-earned position, and the illicit spark between her and Autumn? Read and find out. But that's an interesting take on things, I will say. It's a little, a little bit original there. The Tusks of Extinction by Ray Naylor. This is novella length. When you bring back a long extinct species, there's more to success than the DNA. I believe they've made four movies about that, maybe even five. Bosco has resurrected the mammoth, but someone must teach them how to be mammoths or they are doomed to die out again. There's a reason they died out. Don't mess with things. Dr. Demira Kismatulina is an expert in elephant behavior, was brutally murdered trying to defend the world's last elephants from the brutal ivory trade. Now her digitized consciousness has been downloaded into the mind of a mammoth. As the herd's new matriarch, can Demira help fend off poachers long enough for the species to take hold? See, there they go even messing with that. I have opinions. Or will her own ghost and Moscow's real reason for bringing the mammoth back doom them to a new extinction? Ah, oh, I have issues. Rick Gordon presents A Drop of Venom by Sajni Patel. This is a young adult fantasy. This is an unapologetically feminist retelling of the Medusa myth, steeped in Indian mythology. All monsters and heroes have beginnings. This is mine. 16-year-old Manisha is no stranger to monsters. She's been running from them for years, from beasts who roam the jungle to the king's army, who forced her people, the Naga, to scatter to the ends of the earth. You might think that the kingdom's famed holy temples atop the floating mountains where Manisha is now a priestess would be safe, but you would be wrong. 17-year-old Pratyush is, I'm trying to not slaughter these names, I apologize, is a famed slayer of monsters, one of the king's most prized warriors and a frequent visitor to the floating temples. For every monster the slayer kills, years are added to his life. You might think such a powerful warrior could do whatever he wants, but true power lies with the king. Tired after years of fighting, Patrush wants nothing more than a peaceful, respectful life. When he and Manisha meet, each sees in the other the possibility to chart a new path. Unfortunately, the kingdom's powerful have other plans. A temple visitor sexually assaults Manisha and pushes her off the mountain into a pit of vipers. A month later, the king sends him Patrush off to kill one last monster, a powerful Negan who has been turning men to stone, before he'll consider granting the Slayer his freedom. Except Manisha doesn't die, despite the hundreds of snake bites covering her body and the venom running through her veins. She rises from the pit more powerful than ever before, with heightened senses, armor-like skin, and blood that can turn people to stone. And Pratyush doesn't know it, but the monster he's been sent to kill is none other than the girl he wants to marry. That sounds more like horror to me.
The Penance of Valentine Cash by Rebecca Rook, Kindle Unlimited. Modern adaptation of the Greek legend, The Twelve Labors of Hercules for young adult fantasy readers. See, tell you. Valentine Cash is dead. When she dies in an accident and accidental collision she caused on the cusp of musical fame, Valentine is offered a deal. Complete a series of difficult tasks to get her life back. Fail, and she dies a final, everlasting death. Guided by Route 66, the mother road of America on her quest, she tackles one Herculean task after another, giving up a piece of herself with each trial. Valentine begins to understand that the fame she once sought won't bring her happiness or belonging, and if she fulfills the penance, she must decide what's more important, her old life or restoring the lives of the strangers who died alongside her. The young and the ancient, the tangible and the mythical, collide as Valentine learns the truth, the, meaning, the true meaning of redemption, connection, and the enduring power of the human spirit. That might have some... A good message. Machine Vendetta by Alistair Reynolds. Big name in sci-fi. Third in the Prefect Dreyfus Emergencies trilogy. It is a thrilling tale of deadly conspiracies and old enemies that refuse to die. Panoply is a small, efficient police force dedicated to maintaining the rule of democracy among the 10,000 disparate city-states orbiting the planet Yellowstone. Ingvar Tench was one of Panoply's most experienced operatives, so why did she walk alone and unarmed into a habitat with a vicious grudge against her organization? As his colleagues pick up the pieces following her death, Prefect Tom Dreyfus must face his conscience. Four years ago, when an investigation linked to one of his most dangerous adversaries got a little too personal, Dreyfus arranged for Tench to continue the inquiry by proxy. In using her, did Dreyfus also put her in the line of fire? And what does Tench's attack tell him about an enemy he had hoped was dormant? Simple yet interesting cover. Keo's got the hiccups. Beautyland by Marie Helen Bertino. Is a wise, tender novel about a woman who doesn't feel at home on Earth. At the moment when Voyager 1 is launched into space, carrying its famous golden record, a baby of unusual perception is born to a single mother in Philadelphia. Adina Giorno is a tiny and is tiny and jaundiced, but she reaches for warmth and light. As a child, she recognizes that she is different. She possesses knowledge of a faraway planet. The arrival of a fax machine enables her to contact her extraterrestrial relatives, beings who have sent her to report on the oddities of Earthlings. For years, as she moves through the world and makes a life for herself among humans, she dispatches transmissions on the terrors and surprising joys of their existence. Then, at a precarious moment, a beloved friend urges Adina to share her messages with the world. Is there a chance she is not alone? All right, that is all I had pulled up, but let's see what else might be available. Let's check this one out. And check the release date. This looks to be young adult fantasy. At the conclusion, lots of blurbs. Yep. Beasts of War. Fantasy adventure filled with mythos, monsters, and mortal heroes who are astoundingly human. Once a prisoner to Fedu, the vengeful god of death, Kafi has regained her freedom, but she is far from safe. Fedu will stop at nothing to hunt her down and use her power to decimate the mortal world. 
Toffee knows when Fedu will strike during the next bonding, a once in a lifetime celestial event. To survive, Coffee will have to find powerful new allies quickly and convince them to help her in the terrible battle to come. Once a warrior turned runaway, Econ has carved out a new life for himself outside La Cosa, but the shadows of his past still haunt him. Now, alongside unexpected friends, Econ tries to focus on getting Coffee to the Kusanga Plains before the next bonding. If he fails, Coffee will be consumed either by her own dangerous power or the terrible fate Econ is doing everything he can to prevent. Econ devotes himself to protecting Coffee, but the lingering threats from his own past are more urgent than he knows. As Coffee and Econ race to the Kusanga Plains and to try to garner the help of Ishoza's ancient gods along the way, they must face a slew of dangerous beasts, old and new. In the end, destiny may unite Coffee and Econ for the last time, or tear them apart for good. Did that one. Thriller, serial killer slash fantasy. Um, no. Oh, yeah. I think this was another big one. Sorry about that. Midnight Ruin, Dark Olympus, book number six by Katie Robert. Eurydice Dimitriou has always been the innocent sister, but she's finally ready to step out of the long shadow cast by her powerful family and the ex who shattered her heart. Perhaps rough hands on soft skin are exactly what she needs to forget her heartbreak once and for all. Karen Aridi has been Hades' right-hand man for years. He's given everything to the lower city, but now he's ready to take something for himself. He's only too happy to give Eurydice a special kind of education, but is her heart really free enough to be claimed? Orpheus Makos will do whatever it takes to make things right. Once the golden boy of the upper city, he's now a shadow of his former self. He'll do anything to get your DJ back, even if it means she's not coming into his arms alone. Three hearts, three futures, countless ways to get it wrong. But with enemies slipping through Olympus's faltering barrier to lay siege on the lower city, a trio of broken hearts will be the least of these, <coughs> excuse me, would-be lovers' worries. Let's double check that one. Meantime, let's get some more coffee. Let them burn the divine, ooh, the divine traitors. Book one. Let's double check the date. We are good. Jamaican inspired fantasies follows a God's blessed heroine who's forced to choose between saving her sister or protecting her homeland. Baron Vincent can channel the power of the gods. Five years ago, she used her divine magic to liberate her island from its enemies, the dragon riding Langley empire. But now at 17, Farron is all power powered up with no wars to fight. She's a legend to her people and a nuisance to her neighbors. When she's forced to attend an international peace summit, Farron expects that she will perform tricks like a trained pet and then go home. She doesn't expect her older sister, Ilara, forming an unprecedented bond with an enemy dragon, or the gods claiming the only way to break that bond is to kill her sister. As Farron's desperation to find another solution takes her dark, down a dark path, and Ilara discovers she, the shocking secrets at the heart of the Langley Empire, both must make difficult choices that will shape each other's lives as well as the fate of their world.
lots of fantasy options this week. The Dawn and Its Light by Piper CJ. Should not be the other way around. Pretty covers. Comes out in March. Did that one. We don't do horror. Did that one. Coming of age slash science fiction. Before I bring it up, I'm going to check the date real quick. We're good. 381 by Aaliyah Whiteley. Literary crossover novel about the pressures of growing up and the nature of authorship. In January 2314, Rowena Savalas, a curator of the vast archive of the 21st century's primitive internet, stumbles upon a story posted in the summer of 2024. She's quickly drawn into the mystery of the text. Is it autobiography, fantasy, or fraud? What's the significance of the recurring number 381? In the story, the protagonist fairly walks the horned road, a quest undertaken by youngsters in her village when they come of age. She is followed by the breathing man, a looming presence dogging her heels every step of the way. Everything she was taught about her world is overturned. Following Fairley's quest, Rowena comes to question her own choices, and a predictable life of curation becomes one of exploration, adventure, and love. As both women's stories draw to a close, she realizes it doesn't matter whether the story is true or not. As with the quest itself, it's the journey that matters. We are out of time. But definitely some options there. Yeah, that Midnight Ruin cover was very, very nice. Well, that again is it for today. Uh, we do have sprints tonight at 6.05 Mountain Time, 8.05 Eastern. And that'll go for two and a half hours. We'll be listening to some nice ambient music, kind of like this. And so you can read, you can work on a craft or hobby, work on a puzzle, or just close your eyes, whatever it is you'd like to do. And then tomorrow's morning show, um, we'll be looking at some more historical mystery options for the Midwinter Hist Mist Readathon that I'm hosting. And, uh, and then on Saturday is uh, the marathon sprint of five hours, starting at 1 p.m. Mountain Time, 3 p.m. Eastern. So, I uh, hope you can show up for some or all of them. I appreciate that very, very much. If you like what you're seeing, please hit like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. Tell a friend about us. The more of us, the merrier. Appreciate every single one of you. This morning, thanks so much. You bet. Hope to see you later. Yep. I'll be here this morning, 10 degrees. Yeah, we are at 9, and it's supposed to... That's kind of supposed to be the warm today, but I think we're staying above zero. Winter's here, but up to 41. That's fantastic. Seesaw for sure. Yeah. Woo! Have a great day. Thank you, Mary. I appreciate you being here. Um, so I hope you guys have a good Thursday, Friday Eve. Uh, stay warm, stay safe. And as the banner says here, don't be a bookworm, be a bookie monster. Oh, no, no. Have a good day. God bless.